Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Christian Wagner from Gronau, Germany, and it's my very pleasure and honor to be here as your host today and to moderate a session of the European School of Urology in this one hour webinar with the title The World of Digital in Our Urology Practice. Let me first of all tell you a bit about what we'll have to um, see in the next couple of minutes. Uh, so um, we will have three talks. The presenters will be having about uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, per uh, person. You can ask the questions if you have any questions to the question portal right here in the Q&A. Just hit the button and ask them. There is no chat available. And uh, this webinar is actually being recorded and will be made available afterwards on YouTube and the ESU channels. It is also accredited with one European CME credit point. So if you complete the questionnaire after attending this webinar, you can use it uh, to get CME credit points. The program today um, has three very uh, um, distinct talks and uh, speakers. So I'm really glad to have three international experts in their particular fields available. Um, we will have a talk about artificial intelligence from Andrew Hung from Los Angeles. We'll have a talk about immersive technologies in urology training and teaching from Jacob Biani from Leeds. And uh, last but not certainly not least, we'll have Juan Gomez Rivas from Madrid talk about scientific social media. Um, I'm really glad that uh, even though this was kind of a short notice, we are able to present this program. And I have to thank uh, the presenters in advance for their availability and their willingness to participate. And of course, I have to thank uh, the sponsor of this uh, event who has had no uh, involvement in the program or speaker selection whatsoever. So um, with this, I would like to start with the first talk and introduce Professor Andrew Hung from University of Southern California in Los Angeles. He's an um, assistant professor there and he specializes in robotic surgery and his main focus of uh, um, scientific interest is artificial intelligence and, and machine learning besides uh, teaching technologies and teaching programs. So I'm really glad to have you, even though it's very early in the morning, Andrew, I'm really glad you're here and I'm looking forward to what promises to be a very interesting talk. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you, Christian, for, for inviting me. And, and it's certainly my pleasure. Uh, it's not that early here in the morning. It's around 9.30 local time uh, from Los Angeles. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, so I'd like to share with you uh, some of our work. Uh, here are my disclosures. I am a consultant uh, for Intuitive Surgical. Uh, the work that I'm going to share with you, uh, for the most part, our original uh, research from my group. Uh, and it's uh, been supported by the National Institutes of Health here in the US, as well as a multi-year intuitive surgical clinical research grant. As an overview, I will share with you uh, two concepts. One is about automated performance metrics or APMs. These are largely measures of surgeon efficiency. I'll describe to you uh, in a little bit what that uh, entails. And I'm gonna talk about how we've used machine learning to take such data uh, to predict or anticipate patient outcomes after the prostatectomy. Uh, in addition, I will share with you a concept of surgical gestures and similarly how we've used machine learning models to excuse me, anticipate pa uh, patient outcomes as well. So for the last five years, my team here in the University of Southern California have recorded cases in the operating room, the live uh, theater, uh, for the most part, robotic prostatectomies, radical prostatectomies. The data that we have collected have been the surgical video and synchronized with it what we uh, call systems data directly from the robot. This systems data has uh, instrument kinematics or rather uh, you know, the, the movement of these instruments in 3D space, but also events such as uh, energy use, camera control, et cetera. And it's from this data that we have derived automated performance metrics. So to give you an example, the simplest automated performance metric is simply the average moving time or velocity or acceleration of a given instrument. The more sophisticated metrics have to do with the wrist articulation of an instrument during a specific part of the operation, for instance, uh, during suturing. Here's an illustrative example of what that kind of data looks like. 
Here are uh, two surgeons doing the exact same step of the operation. The red is the, the tip of the right-hand instrument moving in 3D space. The green is the left-hand instrument. These are uh, two different surgeons doing the pelvic lymph node dissection. And as you could see that the two surgeons doing a similar procedure look completely different. The one on the left is a, uh, a very experienced surgeon having done this particular procedure thousands of times. And on the right, it's one of our junior residents just learning how to do uh, this particular procedure. So you get a sense of uh, the data that we are able to collect. Now, our group has published on automated performance metrics for the last five years. This is probably just contemporary uh, publication, and it will hopefully illustrate to you uh, some of the uh, advances and also limitations of these automated performance metrics. So this was published in European Urology Focus last year. We know that for patient outcomes uh, after prostatectomy, there are both patient factors and surgeon factors that contribute to the trifecta outcome. In this first instance, I'm gonna share with you uh, how we have utilized such data to anticipate urinary continence recovery. So for patient factors, we looked at 16 clinical pathological features, such as the patient's age, body mass index, the Gleason score, the clinical stage of, of the prostate cancer. For surgeon factors, we have looked at automated performance metrics and technical skills. What does that mean? Well, remember uh, from a few slides ago, we talked about what automated performance metrics, the moving time, the velocity, the acceleration, and we report such metrics over either individual steps of the prostatectomy. So each of 12 steps of the prostatectomy get its own uh, uh, metrics reported, but also we have reported it in the very minute uh, phases of surgery, such as in suturing, when the surgeon's handling the needle or driving the needle through the tissue. We're studying the, the angulation of the, the wrist during these very small parts of the operation. Examples of uh, technical skill scoring include this. Uh, this is race, uh, which is uh, you know how the surgeon holds the needle during suturing. Uh, how does the needle angle enter the tissue? How is the wrist rotating as the needle is thrown through the tissue, etc. So different ways of measuring surgeon performance. So the task at hand here was we wanted to see if you took these individual data sets, so the patient factors, the automated performance metrics produced during a particular case, or the technical skills of the surgeon, how well can each of these individual data sets help a, a machine learning model? The machine learning model essentially learns from data that it sees to help make predictions of a future with similar um, uh, patterns, okay? And what we found was that if you looked at these individual data sets, their ability to anticipate when a patient will recover function, if you look at just patient factors, their uh, performance or area under the curve is about 0.5. If one is perfect prediction, you, it's, it's not entirely helpful, but it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's just somewhere uh, better than chance perhaps. Automated performance metrics increases that ability to predict. So their ability to anticipate urinary continence recovery after surgery uh, is around 0 0.6. Adding on surgeon technical skill, we can increase that uh, ability to anticipate time to urinary continence recovery by even more to 0 0.7. And combining all of these pieces of information, uh, we approach 0 0.8. So this really summarizes our work in the last five years or so that we've realized that automated performance metrics certainly do help us anticipate outcomes, but it's not, you know, 100% there. This is a, uh, a shifting gear a little bit to another part of the trifecta. We again look at the radical prostatectomy and we look at positive surgical margins as a surrogate for oncologic outcome. So again, we know that there are patient factors, there are surgeon factors. Uh, in this particular uh, uh, paper, which uh, uh, was uh, presented at AUA 2021, we looked at how machine learning with automated performance metrics could help us anticipate positive surgical margins after prostatectomy. In this particular series, we looked at 237 prostatectomies, uh, about 23% of them had positive surgical margins. If you looked at the patient characteristics alone and plug these into a machine learning model, 
the output uh, performance was about 0.72 in its ability to anticipate whether or not positive surgical margin was going to happen or not. For automated performance metrics alone, that uh, performance performance does decrease, but there is still better than chance and ability to anticipate when a positive surgical margin is going to happen. The full model using both the clinical factors and the, uh, the automated performance metrics or the surgeon factor uh, that performs marginally beats out the clinical factors alone. Because we are working with machine learning models, machine learning models not only allow us to anticipate an outcome and it reports the AUC or, or the performance of how well this particular model using old data to, to train with, uh, it also gives us an opportunity to identify which of many different features or characteristics that the models utilize or determine to be the most important to help you predict the correct answer or the, the, the ground truth. And in this instance, we found, again, for looking at anticipating or predicting positive surgical margins when they would occur. Not surprisingly, extracapsular extension or PT stage, both I understand highly correlative to each other, this was by far the most important features to anticipate positive surgical margins. And that makes sense. An important takeaway additionally though, is that these automated performance metrics or measures of surgeon efficiency and and, and their use of, of the robot, while a secondary, uh, uh, have a secondary role for, for importance, nonetheless still contribute significantly to whether or not positive surgical margins do occur or not. The concept of, posit of automated performance metrics, uh, we have uh, written many papers in that regard, uh, and they have been on uh, numerous covers of the Journal of Urology uh, from uh, publications from our group. And we, of course, have been grateful for that attention. Uh, we, we've tried to highlight where its strengths are, but also its limitations. We know that uh, it can only to a certain degree anticipate uh, the eventual patient outcome. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here. We're still gonna talk about the robotic prost radical prostatectomy. Uh, we're gonna focus on erectile functions, the final piece of the trifecta of outcomes after prostatectomy. Uh, whereas in the past few slides, we have talked about how we've used the systems data from the DaVinci robot to anticipate automated, uh, to, to, excuse me, to derive these automated performance metrics, largely measures of efficiency. Uh, we turn our attention just briefly to just the surgical videos. And here I want to introduce the concept of surgical gestures. And what is that? Well, we have decided that one way to look at a different way of looking at surgeon performance is to see if you could decode surgery into its most elemental form. And so for tissue dissection, we think that in tissue dissection, there are blunt dissection, sharp dissection, and then a, a combination of different gestures put together. And these are, are, this is, if you will, the alphabet or vocabulary that we uh, are proposing. So for blunt dissection, there is spreading, uh, and this is at the moment limited to the monopolar curved scissors. I understand other folks use different instruments, but this, is, is, this similar kind of concept can be applied across different kinds of instruments. So here you have, uh, for blunt dissection, the, inch, the scissors spreading, uh, appeal push maneuver to push or spread tissue apart or natural planes. Uh, there's hook and sharp dissection. There's cold cut, uh, hot cut, uh, burn dissect. And combination, this is just more complicated, complex movements. You have pedicles, a two-hand spread, and coagulating uh, a pedicle of tissue, then cutting it. Bear with me here. So if you consider that gesture classification system. Here you see each row representing one case of neurovascular preservation or nerve sparing of the prostatectomy. And as you go from left to right, that is the gestures that are being utilized from frame to frame in the video. So here altogether, there are 22 rows representing 22 cases, 22 nerve sparing steps. And these are the first 100 gestures utilized by the surgeon to complete that task. What's common about these 22 rows or 22 cases is that these are cases where 12 months after prostatectomy, patients who previously had preserved, had erectile function did not recover function. 
In contrast, these additional 18 cases or 18 rows representing 18 additional nerve stair uh, cases or steps, these are cases where the patients had erectile function to start with and had recovered function 12 months after surgery. And these were uh, uh, erections sufficient for uh, intercourse. So if you looked at just the proportion of gestures utilized, for instance, energy usage, and you compared the group on the top with the group on the bottom, it was no different. We had hypothesized that cases that had recovered function may have used less energy. That was not to be the case. When we plugged these, this data into a specialized machine learning model that actually takes into account not only what it sees, but the ordering or the sequence of what it sees, these models, these sequential models were then able to uh, uh, correctly uh, categorize these cases as either cases that recovered function or did not recover function uh, with an AUC of approximately 0.8. So uh, a lot more needs to be determined here, of course. We want to be able to interpret and figure out exactly what it is about these ordering or sequences of the gestures that's allowing the models to correctly anticipate what the outcome may be 12 months after surgery. But this would be groundbreaking, right? Uh, my summary to, what, uh, to my brief talk here today is that Perhaps for one of the first times, we are trying to take what happens on the day of surgery to anticipate outcomes that may be not apparent till weeks to months, to perhaps even years uh, after surgery. So there I will stop and uh, happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I could listen to this for hours because it's so interesting to see what uh, actually the future is right now at our uh, at our footsteps, right before us. Um, it's actually groundbreaking work. So I'm, I'm really um, glad you uh, gave the talk and gave us a short insight about what you're doing there. Um, maybe people are having questions. If you want to use the question and answer button, you can uh, um, address them right now. Meanwhile, uh, let me ask you, um, this kind of box that you're recording with, is that commercially available? Is that something others can use? And is that something that records on the fly and gives you a direct output? Yeah, so, uh, and, and I would be uh, remiss in not uh, acknowledging uh, Christian and uh, Dr. Witt at Brunel uh, for being, uh, you know, part of our, our collaboration and team to be able to really uh, understand this data. And so the uh, the IDR, the intuitive data recorder, I assume you're talking about uh, how we've derived these automated performance metrics. So uh, yes. that is uh, at the moment, something that was is more of a research tool. I know that intuitive uh, probably has other plans for it, maybe on the commercial side. I'm, I don't have any insight to, to that side of things. Um, at the moment, it, it is rather messy in that, you know, it takes uh, quite a bit of, uh, of time and computing power to be able to derive these metrics. But uh, the understanding is that, you know, those kinds of metrics or data will become uh, much more readily available. So what we have utilized in the last five years is not commercially available, but uh, my understanding is there is some form of uh, uh, a commercial product that, that is, it sounds like a, it would be uh, available in, in the near future. Yeah, sounds like this to me too. So right now when you're at the simulator, you can get a direct feedback on how you did your performance. And maybe in the future, not far away from now, you will have that um, available just like uh, on the fly. So we've got to one question from the audience. Thank you for your presentation. How do you think, how do you think is the best way to apply these tools in hospitals? which probably leads us to the way uh, to the question, uh, is that clinically significant? Can we use this already or is that still a, a primary step? Yeah, well, I would say that our performances are, are certainly robust and we, as we have uh, increased our, our uh, the performance of these models, it's important to state that we are constantly looking for partners to be able to to externally validate, right? Uh, what uh, performs well at uh, with surgeons at the University of Southern California, we wanted to uh, see if that same model performed equally as well with surgeons from Gronau, Germany. Uh, and additionally from that, 
uh, we have tried uh, it on uh, data from other sites. Of course, data, uh, data privacy uh, is a main, uh, is a, a tremendous concern, but until we get to a point where these models can broadly generalize uh, to the whole population or a vast population of surgeons uh, is when we would have uh, that confidence that you know truly the signals that we see are, are are true. And so as we have increased our performance, we've also increased our uh, regimen or our uh, you know our standards of how rigorous uh, the the uh, the methods are such that, you know, the models that train on data uh, then validate on data that it's truly never seen. And so uh, over the years, we have certainly uh, uh, heightened that uh, standard because we know that ultimately for this to be acceptable to the broad uh, audience of surgeons and patients is to have the most rigorous uh, approach. And so I wouldn't say that we're quite there, but we are certainly moving in the right direction. And I, I'm hopeful that this is a community effort, a community of surgeons that are willing to uh, to contribute to uh, you know to ask these important questions uh, to get us to a point for one day uh, really we can translate surgeon performance and movements to uh, to outcomes in in the most robust way possible. Yeah, and uh, thank you for that. And one more particular question is actually. Um, did the APMs assessing robotic technique for continence recovery account for additional steps like the Rocco stitch or Rezio sparing technique, or was it a standardized series of steps that was used? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we have uh, attempted to do uh, is that we have attempted to account for a posterior reconstruction uh, and anterior reconstruction. Uh, so a Rocco stitch, for, for instance, would be a great example of posterior reconstruction. That said, even at our own institution, how the Rocco stitch is done at USC varies amongst the 10 surgeons that do it, right? So obviously there is gonna be variation there that we cannot fully capture. So the best, next best thing has been to say, you know, account for the fact that yes, posterior reconstruction has been done or anterior reconstruction has been done. But obviously we understand there are limitations to that kind of designation. I think it's a really good question and we are on the very primary step of learning, but maybe with stronger computers, um, things uh, will be able on the fly and will lead us to more discoveries. And this leads me to the last question here, talking about discoveries. Um, is there a possibility of surgery discovery like in drug discovery? Well, uh, you know, in drug discovery, there is, uh, you know, there are hypotheses and there are very experimentally rigorous uh, study designs, randomized control trials, etc. Uh, we have, as part of our team, a biostatistician who uh, has an, an, an previous and actually concurrent life, uh, part of many clinical trials for pharmaceutical, you know, avenues. So it's, this is actually a perfect question uh, to answer. Uh, ever since maybe three years ago, when we've uh, onboarded this biostatistician, we have essentially tried to replicate the process of clinical trials uh, in a very similar way to how we approach, uh, uh, you know, providing feedback, for instance, to surgeons. And, you know, in, in the same rigor, uh, and, and it's certainly not something that's been seen in education, it is not easy to do uh, because, uh, you know, it's very statistically bound. So it's a balance of traditional statistics, of course, with the more cutting edge machine learning piece. But I've really embraced that, even though uh, my statistician probably gives me more heartburn than anybody else. Uh, I think uh, I've really wanted to embrace that because I think that will only make surgical education, surgical training that much more serious and, uh, and you know, let people poke holes where they need to poke holes because that will just make us stronger in that regard. And so uh, we definitely do see parallels there. Uh, down to you know who our statistician is and 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 the rigor that they they are used to. Great, great uh, answer to a very broad question, which is very important to answer because sometimes things just come by itself, and sometimes we have to just find it in the noise. And there's so much data there that is really difficult to find out what is valuable and what is probably not telling us anything. 
So thank you very much, Andrew, for this very good insight into uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and how to use this in robotic surgery uh, currently and maybe also in the future. Um, thank you very much. And um, we'll switch to the next talk. Um, and um, it's my very pleasure to introduce um, Shekhar Chandra Biani from Leeds, who works as a consultant at the St. James University Hospital and is currently with us, not from Leeds, but from back at his home in India. So thank you very much, Shekhar, for um, staying up very late. So uh, I hope you're fit enough to give the talk and uh, we're looking forward to how, hear what you have to say about immersive technologies in urology training and education. Professor Biani is a very um, well-known expert, especially in the UK for training uh, urologists um, utilizing different techniques and has been doing this for years and he has been uh, very active in the European School of Urology and I'm really glad he's with us. So thank you very much. Thanks, Christian, and um, thanks for the introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the ESU team for the opportunity as well. Uh, I'm based in Leeds, as Christian mentioned, and have uh, some interest in uh, medical education. Um, the pandemic stimulated me to look into this field, although I can say that I'm not an expert in Im emerging technology specifically. And I started to explore alternative methods for training and adapted uh, new technologies in education and training. I did try different devices, including HoloLens and Google Classes. So my, uh, after this high powered and very scientific talk, my talk is going to be very simple and for common urologist. So these are my disclosures. Uh, emerging technology is regularly cited um, as a top 10 trends in every analyst report. So in the next 15 minutes, I plan to discuss why we need emerging technologies, what type uh, of technology we can use, where they can be used and how we have applied them in our training. I will mainly focus on virtual reality and augmented reality. You probably already have heard the statistics about how quickly medical knowledge is doubling. And so what happens when we have so much of information density, we start to multitask and we have to learn new interaction models, which of course increases our cognitive load. What does this mean for our daily experience? We face information overload. And how do you manage that? To manage it, you need attention, which is limited in a world where information is so rich. Herbert Simon, um, a Nobel Prize winner, predicted that a wealth of information would lead to a lack of uh, attention. So how do we increase attention and reduce the cognitive load? The first big value add from immersive technology is ability to harness attention with augmented and virtual reality. If you, if you um, take nothing else from this talk, please recognize that focus on attention and cognitive load are important for a good learning experience. I'm sure you have seen this before. You may notice this, that after two weeks, we tend to remember 10% of what we read 20% of what we hear, whereas we remember 90% of what we say and do. How strange that our education system is based on the former. Numerous studies have been done that show if you are interacting, um, you retain 40 to 60% more information uh, and it does not work if you are just looking at a video, for example. Uh, Columbia University did a study that showed if you are observing uh, the, the manipulation of a structure in virtual reality, there was not a big difference. But if you are using active cognition and interacting with the, that information and knowledge, there is a massive increase in amount that we retain and the speed at which we learn. Another actual uh, benefit of emergent technology is the ability to touch objects. And this is the British Museum. It is one of my preferred interactive pieces because it allows you to touch objects you wouldn't 
um, never otherwise have the opportunity to touch. The alphabet soup we get when we talk about immersive technologies, I'll attempt to provide a visual picture for you to, uh, so that you can remember immersive technology terminology moving forward. Immersive technology often referred as an, as an extended reality is an umbrella term for all technologies that have uh, that has the capability to integrate the real and the virtual world. The degree of immersion is mapped on a virtual uh, reality and virtuality band, depending on the balance between virtual and real life interaction. The physical world is at one end of the spectrum and the virtual world on the other end. So the, the virtual reality emerges in user in a fully artificial digital environment so that there is a, uh, so this is where the whole experience is synthetic. It is not real. The user is emerged in a space that is digitally generated, which may or may not be a copy of a real space. Uh, this can be extracted from a real world 360 degree video. Augmented reality creates an immersive experience for user by fusing reality with the virtual using a digital device such as a smartphone with a camera users are able to see here and interact with with the virtual assets in real time mixed reality not only overlays but also anchors virtual objects to the real world and allows uh, allows for responsive interaction it expands our perception of our surroundings through virtual words or information that are projected into users' field of vision. It is important to look at the unique capabilities of extended reality to enhance learning in context of the health education. Uh, fundamental to this are the interactions and responses that occur between the users and the and the terminology, the SOAR framework considers the internal processes and consequences that arise from the use of immersive technology. There are three components for SOAR framework. Stimuli, any, any modality that initiate a cognitive or effective responses within the user, followed by an internal evaluation undertaken by the users, and finally outcomes from users, use of immersive technology. And I also feel interaction fidelity and your display fidelity are also important contributors. What are the benefits? Uh, when it comes to the education and training, it can make a difference in a trainees learning um, by providing them with more engagement with the material, more immersive interaction, and in turn, less distraction and better attention. Uh, advanced and more relevant testing as well as getting um, the trainees hands-on simulation early on. Due to diverse range of immersive technology modalities available, a focused, targeted, and purpose-built approach can be used with respect to the healthcare sector. Broadly, this can be divided into theoretical, practical, and communication-based applications. Most, most systems are validated for use as task and procedure-based trainers and can be classified as endoscopic, laparoscopic, and robotic. Extended reality systems, uh, communication-based applications can be used to improve uh, real-life operating room dan team dynamics, war rounds, communication, and proctorships. Keeping figures from the cone of learning in mind, we designed a five-day urology bootcamp in 2015. Uh, I would like to share some of our experience of using immersive technology during the bootcamp in the UK. Every year, about 48 trainees attend the course. The important features of the course are one-to-one -one hands-on training covering the urology syllabus for, for the first year urology resident in the UK with deliberate practice and formative feedback. This slide outlined the uh, course template contents and simulators and group rotation. We cover nearly 30 technical skills uh, during the course, and there are two modules on non-technical skills. A variety of models are used for laparoscopy, GRP, urethroscopy, and non-technical skills. 
for DRP uh, skill training, we use a low cost benchtop model and a virtual reality model. The benchtop model allows familiarization with the real equipment and resection skills, while the uh, VR model provides anatomical variation, practice on arterial and venous bleeding control and computer generated data ergonomics. And we think therefore that both models complement each other very well. And in this way, we try to deliver a, compl a complete training program integrating different educational principles and simulators. Similarly, um, for urotroscopy and PCNL, immersive technology systems are used. Uh, the, the PCNL access training is first done on a benchtop model followed by training on an augmented reality model. Uh, for urotroscopy, in addition to the benchtop model, a virtual reality simulator allows the experience of fluoroscopy use of uh, contrast and various energy sources. S simulated clinical scenarios videos are commonly used to help acquire non-technical skills uh, and facilitate reflection. However, the engagement and reflective component of learners are challenging to optimize and assess. We did a small feasibility study last year and we'll be presenting this year at the Pulse uh, National Meeting in June. The aims were to create track and receive feedbacks on novel non-technical skill training videos and allow self-contained learning and to facilitate development in the understanding of the concepts of viability. We think that an innovative method of judging effective reflection can improve learning outcomes. So a high quality 360 degree recording of simulated emergency scenarios were created Experts identified important teamwork, communications, um, decision-making, situational awareness, and leadership events throughout the training video. The feedback was added uh, with visual and audio editing. Uh, a bing uh, the bingo style cards were created with several important prompts uh, to, to add, identify during a non-technical skills and patient safety. There were also false cues to ensure delegates were not selecting any random events without first identifying them. Reflecting, uh, reflective learning was determined by, the, uh, by an assessment section of the video using bingo style questions derived uh, from evaluating appropriate responses. So a questionnaire to determine participants' acceptance of these learning and assessment techniques was developed containing 13 Likert scale system usability questions. Computer-based interactive scenario were shown to participants. 45 surgical trainees participated uh, in one hour video session and completed questionnaire. The rating of efficacy of this learning approach were between 55% to 91%, indicating moderate to strong participation. Um, yeah. The current material was viewed as having a positive effect on non-technical skills acquisition by participants, which could be made accessible via a virtual platform. The Feasibility study, uh, with, from this feasibility study, we have demonstrated that bingo style feedback evokes effective participation. The self-contained nature of the platform uh, can accelerate acquisition of non-technical skills with minimum resource requirements. One, one of the problem in non-technical skills training is that it is difficult for the participant to relive that scenario. Um, the platform may allow this and also repeated reflection and recently we have received extra funding to expand this work further. A systematic review and meta-analysis have demonstrated that, that the group that applied VR uh, medical simulators had significantly higher surgical procedures, skill score, and a significant influence on reducing operating time. However, yet um, AR and VR are not close to what anyone would Call mainstream. 
Uh, and here are the barriers to mainstream adaptation of augmented and virtual reality, like a lack of understanding, cost, uh, return on uh, investment, rate of change, and health and safety issue. However, I think uh, it will get better with time as mobile phones have improved in the last 10 years. So to sum up, just to recap, in virtual reality, virtual objects become reality. Augment reality augmented reality enhances reality. Mixed reality manipulates reality. A new generation of emergent technologies have potential uh, to address many of the challenges faced in healthcare, training, and education. Despite their potential, challenges exist in the, in the design, development, implementation, and understanding of emergent training environments and must be overcome if these technologies are to realize their potential. System development and implementation must focus on learning outcomes and patient care related processes. Bold, uh, bold um, policies based on sound scientific evidence need to be developed to ensure that the power of immersive tools is harnessed to, for efficient and effective education and training delivery. These are my references and Thank you for listening. Thank you, Shekhar. So I think this was an excellent overview about uh, the extended reality that we're currently facing, sometimes because we have to because of COVID, sometimes because we want to, and sometimes because we are just facing it because we're getting it uh, by chance. So um, if anybody of uh, the participants and the, uh, from the floor has any questions, please use the Q&A box and uh, ask questions. Um, meanwhile, um, you talked about the boot camp, and I'm, uh, of course, I know what this is, but uh, is that something that is compulsory in uh, the UK right now? Or is that something that is um, that people can use but don't have to? Can you give us a bit of an insight there? It looks pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. In UK, it is what they call it is uh, one of the recommended course because if they make it mandatory, then Health Education England um, has to pay for it. So right now, uh, on an average in a year, we get around 45 to 50 new trainees in, in, in neurology. So we can accommodate 48 trainees uh, in the boot camp. So almost, I would say, 99% try to attend the boot camp. Uh, we try to deliver in the second week of October, uh, and that allows them to, because they start in, uh, in the first week of October, so that, that allows them to come to the boot camp earlier at the start of their training. So it okay. is highly recommended, and mm -hmm. most of the trainees attend it, but it is not mandatory. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is pretty simple. Of course, I want everyone to be joining this because it looks like a very good program and it's packed with uh, hands-on training and uh, training in non-technical skills. And to be honest, uh, a kind of training a camp like this, we don't have that in Germany. We have a lot of talks and we have a lot of seminars, but a very dedicated week of training uh, is not yet available, at least not in Germany. But we're bringing it with the ESU hopefully soon a small version of it with the bootcamps international and i think you started to spread it also to europe right yeah we have done that thing in uh, three uh, courses in lisbon in the last four years and one in belgium mm -hmm. um, and mainly the what we tend to do is it's all hands-on hardly any lectures just you start with small introduction what the delegates are going to do during the four-hour session uh, and it is one-to-one, -one, so you can ask any any type of question. There is less anxiety among trainees uh, while they're going through all these skills. Uh, and we cover almost whole of the first year curriculum completely, whatever technical skills they are supposed to do. In addition, we add the non-technical skills, so it's like omni-learning, so you cover all angles. Um, we create a ward simulated ward with actors. So they have to do a ward round. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. and that is recorded and they get a feedback on their performance um, dealing with difficult relatives or, or unhappy right. patients. Right. So um, I have a couple of questions coming in, which most of them are actually addressing the same topic, which is, can people from outside of the UK also participate in the boot camp, or is it only for UK residents? Um, I think uh, four questions um, addressing this. Uh, so is it available for others as well, or is that currently only reserved for UK residents? No. Previously, we have um, given, if there are any empty slots, yes, we have, um, we had about four trainees. Uh, in fact, one of the, your trainee came for three years ago. So if there are empty slots, yes, we, we tend to take overseas. But if there are no slots, then, then, then not possible. Okay. And um, one more question before we have to move to the next uh, topic. Thank you for the lecture. I'm interested to know what could special in the urology science that determine the way to teach it. So I guess the, the question is, um, is there anything in uh, urology science that tells us how to teach urology? Is there something that is going deeper than this? Uh, I don't think so. It means when you're teaching skills training, it is same whether you do general surgery, urology, orthopedic basic, uh, principle one needs to follow, keep it simple, try to pay um, uh, attention to the contents and not to overload the trainee. So your instructions should be very clear uh, and reduce the cognitive load as I've suggested uh, in my talk. Yes, I think this is a very important key point. Uh, we tend to uh, put too much information into the resident. And when there's too much information, there's usually an overload and they tend to stall and just look at, at you. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that you gave us an insight about hands-on and about immersive technologies, because I believe that there unfortunately are a lot of residents who uh, on daily basis experience hands-off training uh, instead of hands-on. And I'm uh, glad that you're bringing the hands-on part uh, to the forefront. So thank you very much, Shekhar, for your great talk and for your participation. And I wish you a good night in India. And uh, thank you. Thanks thank you very much. You. Um, we have to uh, move to um, the next talk, which is presented by Juan Gomez Rivas. Um, he is a consultant urologist at Urolo. Urolo Urological Clinico in Madrid, and he's also uh, very well known in the urology world as the current chairman of the Young uh, Academic Urologist Group. And he has a very um, good insight in scientific uh, social media because he's very active in this field. I don't know how many followers there are because I don't count followers or whatever. I'm not even on Twitter, um, but uh, you can give us an insight about scientific social media, what the urologist needs to know. So I'm really looking forward to learning from you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction, Christian. And uh... If you're not, if you are not on Twitter, I I encourage you to be <laughs> not not on Twitter, but at least in a in a, in a, in one of the scientific social media that I will I will explain now. We have seen in the previous presentation um, a way of going in, in a novel way of going of of probably the technical and non technical skills that we have seen, and now we are going to the academia and. Uh, to the to the scientific production, let's say, and and the human since uh, since ancient times has always had the time to communicate. That made us to develop symbols, then of course to develop a language, then move to the to the to the print, and of course since the the latest uh, decades to thanks to the internet, to email, and of course, social media. So social media is just a, a way of the evolution of the communication of the human being. And this is data from a digital around the world that was uh, published in October, 2021. And we can see here that 67% uh, of the global population has a mobile and 61% of them has access to internet and more than half of the global population is uh, active on social media. So what is social media? Social media, the concept of social media is simple. It's a, it's a, it's a communication platform where the users 
are able to create the content by themselves. This is the, the, the main aspect of social media. The users that are inside this platform are able to modify the contents the way they want. And this is used uh, and this is done by a, a technology called Web uh, 2.0. We must be aware that nowadays we are giving birth to the generation X or let's say the, the, the touch screen uh, generation. These are the, the young people that is born since uh, the mid nineties to, to nowadays. And this population of course is very aware of the usage of all these new technologies that we have been talking today. Regarding uh, science, regarding academia, there's a high presence of researchers in scientific social networks, but it's not always usually effectively. A few people take advantage of its true potential and many of them forget the main objective, which is uh, knowledge sharing and relationship building. This is a survey that we did in, uh, in the ESRU, in the European Society of Residence in Neurology, like four or five years ago. And uh, of the respondents, of course, uh, most of them were users of social media. And here we can see that 93% 90 uh, of them uh, use social media uh, in, in personal purposes, and um, some of them also use uh, social media on professional purposes. And amazingly, uh, when they were asked about the usage of social media for news or, techno or knowledge or being updated regarding uh, scientific works, social media was ranked three, uh, for example, over congresses and the classic textbooks. We have to take account also that, for example, journals, all the journals, uh, European Urology, World Journal of Urology, et cetera, has a, a social media active account and many people go there to be updated. And for um, being uh, updated in surgical techniques, YouTube was the first platform where people goes to uh, know and to be updated in surgical techniques beyond textbooks or other websites. Uh, there is a controversy regarding if YouTube is uh, social media or not. I would say yes, because if we go to the objective um, concept of social media that are the users modifying the, the, the context, of course, you're able to have a YouTube, a YouTube account, you're able to upload your contents, you're able to modify them. So, of course, it's a social media. The problem of these social media, these social media, I mean the, the classic social media that you are able to, to use, which are Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, now TikTok. These are uh, um, personal social media, let's say, or uh, there are open environment for everyone. So there is a mix between all the information that you can get through this social media. There's a mix on personal information, professional information, scientific information, education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to, to, to solve this gap or to solve this issue, there are scientific social media. So scientific social networks or academic networks allows just the researchers to connect to other ones that are in the same line, regardless the, the, the place on the world they are located, and of course, to share information, resources, and documentation. Amazingly, many of the researchers doesn't know about the existence of academic social network, specific academic social networks. And this is a paper that we published in 2019. Uh, if you want to go deep into this subject, because in, in these 10 minutes that I have, probably I, I won't be able to explain all of this. You can, of course, download this paper and read it deeply where you can see um, how, social, how scientific social media is a new way of expand knowledge and what do you need to know? Which are the benefits of scientific social media? The benefits are that you are able to connect with professionals in your fields, to expand the network of your, con of your contacts, to share information and other contents, to exchange opinion and access resources of, uh, access resources of interest. Uh, social networks are for exclusive use of professionals who you have uh, you avoid to get, let's say, trash information from people which are not professional or commercial vias, let's say. Some of them has job banks. They help you to create a personal uh, brand and, of course, helps you also to disseminate the contents that you are publishing. The drawbacks, that is difficult to position yourself in the market. 
all social media, not only scientific social media, always social media uh, has the problem of lack of privacy. And, and this is something that you have to be aware of. Whatever you publish in social media, it's a way of your control. So there's a poor control of data. There's a possibility of, of identity thief. Uh, some, if you are not aware of, of all, the, all the recommendations that are done for the social media usage, you can go to copyright infringement. And many people uh, always say that they don't have time for use them. Which scientific social media exists? There exists two ways of scientific social media. There is the author identifiers and the author profiles. And this is very important. The author identifiers are unique identifiers that make you possible to manage your professional identity and make your work unequivocally associated to you. And why is this? I will put you see, here some example. For example, this paper comes uh, from Asia and here you can see how many people last name one in this paper, many of them. And this might be a problem in the time you are, for example, doing your CV. Maybe the same, the same problem it's found with other authors. This is myself. Uh, look uh, in PubMed in different ways. Here you can see the, the, the results are very different, different, depends on the way you look for yourself in the search engines. So author identifiers solve this problem. They standardize your name and your affiliation. They correct the identification errors. They group all your publications in just one platform. It facilitates you the retrieval and dissemination of publications, increase your visibility. You can obtain statistics of your work and I will show you this with some, some examples later. They link different author profiles that you may have. And of course, as it's a social media, it enables you to contact other related researchers. These are the different, uh, um, the different uh, author profiles or author identifiers that you might use. I will cover only in this lecture, probably ORCID because it's like in the mood, everyone and, or every, every page, scientific page, I, I, mean, I mean when you are reviewing a paper, when you are submitting a paper, where you're submitting a grant, many of them ask you for your ORCID ID. So your ORCID ID is like your scientific ID. So I, I, I'm not saying that everyone must have an ORCID, but it's very, very recommendable because it allows you to centralize all your scientific information just in one platform. So as I said here in, here in the slide, uh, you can check that ORCID ID is your unique identifier that, reliably, that is reliably and connects you with other researchers among the globe. And this ID is, it can be used for everything. It can be used for paper submission, for application for grants, for reviewing papers, and everyone will know that you are the one that is doing it. The benefits are um, countless. I have said them before, but we can uh, recheck them. So uh, you can easily connect with your contribution and affiliation, avoids the mistaken of identity, saves you time because with your ORCID ID, saves you many, many times by the time you are submitting a paper or you are reviewing because uh, you, with entering only your ID, uh, you don't have to enter your name, your affiliation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because it's all centralized. Improve the recognition of you and your research, increases your discoverability. Um, you own and you control your record. This is very important. And uh, many, many systems are connected to ORCID, for example, European Urology, World Journal of Urology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's free, it's free for use. It's uh, very easy to, to sign to ORCID. You have to go to the website, orcid.org. You register for ID, and then you have to use, or you can use this ID for everything that you need. This is the, the, the way that you might see your own page in ORCID. Here you can see that you have your own code or your own ID, let's say with your contact details, other IDs that you might have, uh, other author's IDs. And um, it's like a, a, a CV, an online CV. You can see your employments, your education, uh, memberships, the foundings that you have applied, 
the works that you have published and the journals where you work as a peer reviewer. Author profile, this is uh, different. The author's identifier helps you to put together in just one platform all your work and author profile helps you to do this, but something else. Uh, and what is this something else? Something else might be, for example, uh, to join a research community. Uh, for example, academia.edu works for that, ResearchGate. It helps you to uh, have a bibliographic manager, for example, Mendeley, or also can be combined with some search engines such as Google Scholar. I will explain you very, uh, very quickly, ResearchGate. This is a, a scientific social media that has a search engine and you can have a simultaneous research through all the main external databases. It links you to PubMed, to Escopus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can find bibliographic researchers on more than 7 million documents and facilitate the authors to upload their scientific research in the platform and maximize their visibility. And it's for free. Here you can see you, you can have your personal data, your affiliation, your contact details, and can give you some metrics, metrics regarding your citation, regarding the reads of your documents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The documents that you might find thanks to the, um, to the search engines is if the documents are available because the author has uploaded them, you can download them for free. This is a very, very useful tool by the time you are doing some scientific research. And you can have also the metrics on your own documents. You can search for your documents and other documents, and you can see how many have, people have read it, how many people have uh, cited, and also have a bio, bibliometric indicator such as the age index. Google Scholar is another scientific social media, and it's very useful for the, for the calculation of the age index, which, which is a, a bibliometric, uh, bibliometric um, uh, data, and also centralize all your documents in just one space. I'm almost finishing, and I will. I would like to recall uh, Winston Churchill here, and also, of course, Spiderman, that the great power comes with great responsibility. And uh, social media has a, a big potential because it's it allows you to communicate with everyone in the world. For example, this is the campaign November. November that uh, many of you probably are are used to it. And here you can see that thanks to social media, November has. Uh, a huge impact raising awareness and raising money for investigation on men's health. These are my, my colleagues from BURST. Uh, and I also like to call them here because thanks to social media and thanks to the power of social media and to a huge campaign that they have done, they have managed to do big, big scientific work. For example, this is the Identify study. And thanks to their publications in social media, they managed to involve in this study more than 33 countries, more than 175 hospitals in a database of more than, here in the slide is 7,500 7, patients, but the actual publication has more than 10,000 patients. And this was recruited thanks to the awareness raised on social media for in being included in this study. Uh, so scientific social networks provide the mean for uh, publishing contents, uh, for sharing your resource, uh, for sharing your results, and why to use them, to be globally connected, to communicate with your audience, to increase the visibility of your production, to receive real feedback from other researchers, and of course, to create and share your contents. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Juan. So you made me consider actually going to Twitter and creating an account now um, just to get more visibility. Um, meanwhile, we're waiting for some questions from the pan from the floor. Um, I would have one question. Is it also dangerous to have it? Like uh, talking about fake news, is that an option to just fake news on social media and put it out there and maybe say smoking is good for you and uh, it will not lead to having bladder cancer? Is that a problem that people are aware of? Yes, that's a, that's a big problem, uh, as you have said. Um, first of all, for 
recommend recommendation for, for professionals to go to social media, I would recommend them, if you are going to social media in a, in a professional way, you should read the recommendations from the EAU or the BJUI. You should read the, this recommendation beforehand you go to social media because they are very useful in order to know how to use them and what to avoid and what to do and what not to do. Uh, and the other thing that you asked is regarding patients. Probably patients are uh, able to receive some fake news, as you have said. And for this, uh, this is a call probably to the organizations. This is a call for the EAU, for your national organizations to create reliable data and to make this reliable data available for your patients. So the patients cannot go to unknown websites, let's say, and, and get information for there. So it's part of the organization to create reliable data, such as, for example, the AU does with the patient information project. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you mentioned this. And um, it's really important that you have the source available. So you don't just follow anyone with a lot of followers, but it's not a reliable source. And I guess that EAU uh, and other platforms are actually delivering this. Um, and they're actually good to follow them uh, instead of somebody else who's just uh, tweeting a lot, uh, but uh, doesn't have anything to say, maybe. Uh, maybe there's a, re a reason behind this. Um, and I'm glad that the EAU has this platform also on social media available. So you don't only have to wait for the next journal to come out, but you get the latest news uh, directly at your feet. Um, I have a couple of questions here that we can try to answer. Um, what is actually the significance of altmetric, the number that appears beside article citation? Altmetric, it's a, yes, it's a good question. <laughs> altmetric is, a, is one bibliographic measurement uh, besides of citation that is how many times your article was visualized in social media or any uh, way of uh, online platform, let's say. Mm -hmm. So it gives you an actual view of the visibility of your work because citation is the people that read your work and cited in their own work. But all metrics give you the view of how many people has searched for your paper, downloaded it, or checked it on a website. So it gives you a, a, an objective way of the, of the visualization of your work. Okay, I wasn't aware that this is actually available, but this looks like a very, very valuable tool. And the question um, is uploading an article to ResearchGate violating journals' copyrights. I think this yes, is a very good and, question. And this is something that ResearchGate, uh, ResearchGate asks you before you up upload the article. They ask you if you have the copyrights of uploading it. Probably if it's a, a, an open access uh, article, there are many, many open access journals, you can do it. You can upload your article in a private way. You can upload it in your search gate and make it open, which probably might, might go into copyright uh, in infringement, let's say. But you can upload also in a research gate in a private way. So you can have it as a, as a personal CV in, a, in an online platform. And if someone asks you for, because in ResearchGate, uh, there's a, it's a community and, and many people might ask you to, to share your, your reviews or to share your, your papers, you can share with these people in a private way. You, you can do it. But you must be aware that there might be some issues with copyright, of course. Are you aware of any issues that happened really after ResearchGate? I mean, maybe some, some somebody put some paper on and was there uh, any publisher who went to court for this are you aware I, I of this? haven't i haven't heard about this about this mm. I, what, what i have only heard about this is not research gate it's about the the, the this uh um this scientific uh, girl from russia that uh, has this website and and is uh, on a legal issue with elsevier and all these people mm. because she she make uh, she made uh, through the deep website she made uh, available many many scientific work but uh, I mean, this is a, a large scale, uh, let's say, uh, copyright uh, infringement. But I mean, if, if you ask me my personal opinion, I say that academia and scientific work should be open. If you don't make it open, you don't make it available for everybody in the world. So knowledge should be available for everyone. And that's yeah. my, my, my personal opinion. 
Yeah, I totally agree on this. Uh, of course, we have to take into consideration that uh, also publishing uh, scientific work costs a bit of money. And uh, of course, Elsevier and Springer and others have interest there. But uh, I think ResearchGate does a good job there in telling you that you can spread it in case somebody asks for a private copy. But it's not like creating a website where you can uh, download everything for free, um, because uh, also our work is not for free, of course. So I guess we answered all the questions. We went a bit over time. Um, I have one more uh, guy uh, who wants to, uh, will be happy to join and motivate others to join from Middle East and Pakistan. But uh, I don't think this uh, this particular platform here, the Zoom is is not a social media uh, kind of inter, um, interchange. So um, yes, please go out and motivate everyone uh, to, to watch this video and to be online and to be on social media. So uh, thank you very much, Juan, for uh, giving your talk. It was really good giving it us some really good insight into this field. Uh, to be honest, I'm not a specialist for this, but uh, you gave me a broader view. So thank you very much. And with this, I would like to conclude our session and uh, thank uh, all the speakers who contributed, as well as the European School of Urology, who is providing this format. And last but certainly not least, I would like to acknowledge uh, the sponsor of this Educational Grand Intuitive Surgical, who has had no involvement in the selection of the program talks or the speaker selection. Thank you very much. This talk will be online uh, and available in a couple of days. And uh, if you want to claim some CME, there will be a questionnaire that you can answer uh, afterwards and you can claim the CME later. Thank you very much from Corona Germany and have a great night and stay safe and peaceful, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>